Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, testing stage at Agile 2012 on Wednesday morning. Thanks for all getting up bright and early. Uh, my name is Joe Sumble. This is Sam Barkley. Hi. And we're here to talk to you about maintainable acceptance tests. Uh, so if that's not what you're here to speak about, now would be a great time to go and see one of the other fantastic speakers around today. Um, we, this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, so creating high quality acceptance tests is step one, uh, and that's hard, but then maintaining them over time is, is, is harder. And so we're gonna talk about how you structure a maintainable test suite, and then the context around that. So two particular things, teamwork, how teams should work together to build maintainable acceptance test suites, and test data, which is always uh, a thorny topic around acceptance tests. So if you only remember four things, these are the four things that you should remember. Quality is everyone's responsibility. High quality test suites are continuously curated by testers and developers working together. So that's a sneak preview of what we're going to say about teamwork. Test code should be treated with the same love as production code. And we don't believe in exhaustive story level testing. It's not a good basis for maintainable acceptance suites. So that's the only reading from slides we're going to be doing today. Um, and uh, that's kind of the, the introductory stuff that you should bear in mind. So when looking at tests, uh, there's a, a nice way of classifying them that Brian Merritt came up with. He's one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto. And he came up with this quadrant diagram, which classifies tests um, according to whether they support programming or critique the project on one axis, and whether they're technology facing or business facing on the other axis. So, uh, who's seen this diagram before? Okay, many of you. Excellent. So, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, except to note, you know, that there, there's, I've kind of put where stuff should be automated and where it should be manual. Stuff on this bottom left-hand side, technology-facing tests that support programming, the stuff that developers write, unit tests, component-level tests, system tests, that should all be automated, obviously. Up on the top right, Showcases, usability testing, exploratory testing. This is where everything needs to be manual. This is where you need creativity and imagination and all these things that humans have that are really important that computers don't have. Um, and in particular, we're going to talk a lot about acceptance testing, obviously, because that's the title of the talk. But this stuff should all be automated. There's no place for human beings to be doing regression testing uh, manually. That's an appalling waste <coughs> of human creativity and imagination and, and people shouldn't be doing that. My colleague Neil Ford has a joke that when computers, uh, when humans do the things that computers could be doing instead, all the computers get together late at night and laugh at us. Yeah. <laughs> and nowhere is that more true than in the case of manual regression testing. It, it, this is 2012. Nobody should be doing manual regression testing. Um, in the bottom right hand corner there's <laughs> what's laughingly called non-functional acceptance criteria. Um, <laughs> Because uh, you know, if your website goes down because it's not able to cope with the number of people accessing it, that's that's often described as being uh, non-functional uh, in real life. So um, uh, we prefer to call them cross-functional often because that's a kind of more meaningful term. So looking at the left-hand side, I mean, if you focus on the left-hand side here, we can kind of divide, we can kind of classify these tests further. Uh, Mike Cohn has the uh, test pyramid. Who's come across the test pyramid? Okay, many of you again. So we won't spend too much time on this. The, except to note, I mean, UI tests here, that there should be less UI tests than service level tests, and there should be less service level tests than unit level tests. Uh, and that's really all that you want to take away from the testing pyramid. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it, I mean, it would be more accurately described as a, a quadrilateral, perhaps. Um, it, it's just a, more of this than this than this. And what you want to avoid is having what's called the inverted pyramid, uh, which is a very common anti-pattern where people have loads and loads of tests at the UI level that are created by testers using QTP yep. or something hideous like that, and very few unit tests because the developers don't like writing tests, because what's the point in that? Um, who, who works on teams that, where there's proper unit testing that goes on? Okay, many of you. How many people do test-driven development where you write the test before you write the code? Excellent. That's oh. the highest proportion of people I've ever seen in a talk who's answered yes to that question. So that's really great. Normally, 
even in Silicon Valley, when I give a talk, I always ask this question about TDD. In Silicon Valley, it was something like 25% of people who came to the talk about continuous delivery did TDD. And I was appalled, because I thought, you know, here we are next to Stanford. Here are allegedly the brightest and the best of the IT industry, and only 25% of people are doing unit testing. I mean, it's just brutal. Um, so, hooray. Uh, congratulations to all of you. Um, and then, I mean, what you can say, really, is that these things at the top, um, UI service level tests are our end-to-end -end business facing tests and then at the bottom we have our localized technology facing tests. So, did you want to add no. anything to that? No. Um, we're going to present five principles and uh, this is an IT conference. So the first principle is principle zero, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not uh, VB users here. So, writing good acceptance tests is, is hard. Uh, and what, what do we mean by good? Obviously, we have an undefined term here, and that's bad. Um, uh, and and this, is, this is crucial. If the tests are green, we should know that the software works. That's what a good test is. And that's the interesting thing about this is that it goes back to the pyramid, and really what the pyramid is saying, uh, and this is saying, are one and the same. It's not that there needs to be an absolute percentage of one is to two is to three of any of those test num numbers um, across the different kinds of tests you have. What's important is to have this quality. Can you be absolutely certain that when your tests go green, you can just release the installer or the application to the public and be confident that your application works as expected? And that level of confidence is the first thing you need from your acceptance test suite, and everything else about it can come later. Yeah, I mean, if you have some magical framework <coughs> that does crazy things. I mean, whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as this is true, you've done the right thing. I mean, that's it. Um, and, and crucially, um, is there like an inverse version of this? If the tests are red, it means there's actually a bug? Well, I'm not sure of that. No, because th that's, that's, this is the flaky test problem, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, if your tests are red and it's because there's, oh, we don't care about that, it's probably an environmental problem, let's rerun the tests, you know. That's bad too. Yeah. Red should actually mean there's something wrong. So, um, you want to talk yeah. about Mingle? So, to give you an example of, um, so a lot of times I hear people say things like, well, it's easy to get started with acceptance tests. You can get started with whatever Selenium recorder, what have you. Um, but then, how does it scale three years down the line, four years down the line? I worked on a project for uh, six years. We started in October 2006, and we, we, the product is still in active development. The acceptance tests for that product have been running ever since the first week, which is when we had an application that would had enough layout that we could actually start testing it. So they've been running since October 2006, and they're still running. They st we started with about 20 tests that ran in about uh, five to 10 seconds. Um, 500 lines of code and on that check-in, uh, and uh, two minutes end-to-end -end with Rake starting up the server and everything else. And in 2012, we are, run we are running about 3,000 tests. These tests take 12 hours if you actually run them serially end-to-end, -end, but we parallelize them and we get the build down to about 55 minutes for that. Um, and it's about 50K lines of code. And these Which tests... Sorry, what's the ratio of test to code? Oh, test to code, we have a ratio of one is to 2.5. So for every line of code, we've got 2.5 lines of test code. Um, and that's pretty standard for a Rails application from what I hear. Uh, I just did a straw poll uh, around and I find that the number is anywhere between 1.9 to 2.8. Um, so that seems to be fairly common and we kind of fall into that same spectrum. So this is, not, this is not to boast, but it's merely to show that it is possible for a test code base to grow in scale with your application's functionality and still be maintainable and run over the long term. And uh, some of the lessons we learned from that are what we are going to be presenting today. And, and one of the things, I, I, I'm not, I was never working on the Mingle team, but I used to go <laughs> around there, and one of the things I noticed is that their acceptance tests were always green, except for the occasional red. And when it was red, they would fix it. So that, for me, means that the test suite is actually alive and, mm -hmm. and, and a living thing, is when, people, when it goes red, people pay attention and they actually fix it. Right? So, so that, that's kind of success. We don't run the tests end-to-end -end in 12 hours. We have a big rack of computers and we run them in parallel and it takes about 45 minutes to get the mm -hmm. feedback from that and our limiting factor on uh, acceptance tests is currently our electricity bill <laughs> which is a nice problem to have um, <coughs> there's a guy called gary groover in the audience here uh, who used to be <laughs> who used to work for the hp laserjet firmware team um, he's got a really interesting book out um, later on this year i think on how hp did that um, and they actually ended up building 
acceptance tests that use logic boards from the HP printers in order to run acceptance tests continuously as part of their deployment pipeline. Um, so you can do this stuff with firmware. Anyone who says you can't do acceptance testing, oh, because we're doing hardware or firmware, it's, it's lies. Go and read uh, Gary's book, and they'll talk about how they did it at HP. How many acceptance tests did you have? Do you remember? About 20,000. About 20,000, <laughs> right. And how long did it take to run those? 24 hours. 24 hours, okay. So this is on a hardware project, end-to-end uh, -end acceptance tests in an emulated environment on logic boards. It, it, it's do all this stuff is possible. If, I mean, if you take one thing away from today, take away the message that this is possible, whatever your domain. There's no excuse for not doing it. Just more details on stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. In between, we moved, we moved offices across four continents and four offices. Um, and the tests continued running. In fact, every time, every time we moved an office, the tests were down for one day, and then we'd get back into the office. First thing we'd do before starting production code was get the bills up and running, and once they were green, we'd start writing code again, and the development cycle would begin. So. so we're going to look at some of the causes of test suite decay. I mean, because it's often the case that people abandon test suites, <coughs> acceptance test suites, and they don't say, we're going to abandon test suites now, unless they're very brave. What instead <laughs> they do is they just ignore them and they're read all the time. So why does this happen? Um, this is your so there's a, there's a couple of reasons why this happens. I mean, at the end of the day, if you are rigorous about automation and if you're using a good quality general purpose language, um, your acceptance test suite is, is a code base and it can decay for all the same reasons that a code base does. Uh, so if you have excessive duplication, poorly named variables, long methods, any of these things, um, some of the, which are compounded by the tools that we use, uh, these can all contribute to test decay uh, just from a code perspective. Uh, the more pernicious thing, um, is when tests decay due to a uh, decay of intention. And uh, this is actually quite interesting because in the long term, the only thing that stays stable about your application is the intention, the, the real reason why you wrote that test, what it's trying to express. Uh, and not paying attention to that or not being able to express that succinctly um, and using something, uh, using a language which is not at a high enough level to be able to express that is another really common reason why um, tests decay from an intention perspective. And um, the, other, the other reason is because quite often, all too often in a lot of companies, um, can everybody see that point? Uh, only so. testers. Uh, only testers care, care about, about maintaining. maintaining tests. And uh, that's, I mean, if the, f if the second reason was pernicious, uh, this is even more pernicious. This is a systemic people problem. And it's al almost always considered that, oh, the acceptance test suite belongs to that team, those people. There's an us versus them mentality, the people that sit in the other building and just keep sending us bug reports. And that is another problem, the reason that uh, developers don't pay enough attention to working, pairing, and having a regular channel of communication with testers and collectively owning the, the test suite. And this is one of the reasons that we think outsourcing uh, outsourcing testing is evil and that it's impossible to create a high quality product when you outsource the testing to uh, you know a, a different organization or even a different group within the same organization <coughs> because if the whole team doesn't care about tests about quality you're, you're hosed you can't create a good quality product it's impossible yep so based on that we're going to be running through our five principles this is where the five principles really start <laughs> and um, the first principle is um, that tests are first-class citizens of your project. Uh, Jess? So <clears throat> what this means is that you should be treating your tests code with the same love and care and attention as your production code. And that means refactoring your test code and um, keeping it in version control and uh, in inspecting it and, 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 and having everyone care about things like layering and encapsulation <laughs> Uh, and all these object-oriented principles which we would use um, to, to write production code. Your, your, te your test code should have structure, it should be uh, well-structured. Logical, you should be able to reason about it in the same way that you reason about your production code. Uh, you should be using a proper language with proper tooling in order to write your <coughs> test code. Uh, there's plenty of languages out there, but don't use something that doesn't have like a, a nice IDE where you can do uh, refactoring and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, have you got anything to add to that? No. OK. That's one of the most important ways to prevent test code from decaying. Yeah. So when you treat, it, when you treat test code as production code, uh, the first thing that happens is a lot of the development practices that you use to keep your production code clean start becoming relevant for your test code base as well. Um, and 
you, so you need to refactor relentlessly. So don't be afraid to refactor. Your code base should be in a place where you can still extract methods, conceptually extract um, uh, things about your test. The expressions of intent of mechanics in your test should be extractable and reusable across your testing code base. And that is the kind of refactoring you would do. Uh, you would not repeat yourself. This is, uh, this is particularly bad. I mean, how many people here have had to change a link and 70% of your tests run green and the, because the link text change, there's one test somewhere that used the raw text in its click selector and all of a sudden it breaks because it was not extracted into a method and there was no one place where the aspect of clicking that link was expressed in your code base. And when that gets littered, uh, the same problems that you have in production code start manifesting themselves in your test code, and you have tests that start failing unexpectedly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 we, we promise this is the only really bad joke uh, that we've got. <laughs> and. Uh, the last point, uh, do not use record and playback tools to build your entire suite. Um, I mean, uh, we all laugh at doodleware when, when somebody goes up to a, you know, a, a, an, an IE and starts scribbling UML and all of a sudden that just generates your domain model and you expect it to work with that. If you find that funny, I don't see why you would find a record and playback tool that generates really awful code behind the scenes, which you can't really maintain in the long term, acceptable. So it should be completely unacceptable to use record and playback tools to create your entire test suite. You can use them in snippets. Record to find out what the selector is, get that one line of code written, but then after that, it's your responsibility to put them all together, structure the entire sequence of steps in a more meaningful way, and uh, generally I've not come across, even the best ones uh, do not uh, do uh, a good enough job of creating a, a large-scale test. Uh, and to decay of intention. So the really important thing is to realize that uh, just because you structure your test with a given when then, it's, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient for all kinds of tests. This may be enough to express acceptance criteria for stories, but that does not mean that uh, you use them to express your test. Because uh, once again, as we mentioned, we don't believe that a story acceptance criteria driven test is a way to maintain tests in the long term. Because Stories are an artifact of the iterative part of Agile. They are used in order to get stepping stones to get to where you really want to be. Stories die and they're gone. The acceptance criteria of a story do not really make sense once a story has stopped existing. So what you want is some way to express the narrative for the user from the user's perspective rather than necessarily from a story's acceptance criteria perspective. Um, you need to be able to separate intention from mechanics. Uh, this is well, the aspect of clicking a link or submitting a form should be different from what the user is hoping to accomplish by doing that. And that's what we mean by separation of intention and mechanics. One part of it involves you filling in fields and clicking buttons and waiting for pages to load and waiting for Ajax to complete. And the other part of it is what the user is actually accomplishing as a part of their journey uh, through your application. And it's important to be able to separate that. And that's, we're going to give an example of this in just a minute. So if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you right now, then we're, we're going to talk about this in some more detail. A couple of things I should have said at the beginning, so sorry about that. Firstly, please ask questions during the talk. If you have questions or queries or you want to tell us we're totally wrong, uh, that's, that's great. We love, we love that. So please put out your hand. Yes? So would you expect intention and mechanics to generate different acceptance tests? No. Intention would be the expression of your acceptance tests and the mechanics would be an implementation of it, and the two would get hooked up together, and I'll show you what I mean in just a second with the example. The, the other thing I, I should say, uh, we'll come to the questions, is this is the first time we've ever given this talk. Um, <laughs> so sorry if it's not as polished as, as you would normally expect, and please give us feedback at the end. You will have feedback forms, yep. so if I forget to say that later. Yes? So the mechanics are just a good piece of navigation to get to the intent. Yes, absolutely. And you typically, and so if I get to the next slide, you typically, um, use a natural language to express your intention. So you'd use a very, very English-like language, preferably. If, well, if you're not English-like language, but a native, but a regular language, a speaking language to actually express your intentions. And you would use a general purpose programming language to express the mechanics. Because uh, what people say about the application does not change from minute to minute or over a course of a release. But you may want to change the testing framework, you may want to change the language of implementation, and all those things uh, <coughs> may change. And you may want to be able to do kinds of refactorings in your test code base that are not necessarily expressible in the natural language domain or stay static in the natural language domain. Did you want to say something? Mm. And finally... Oh, sorry, there was one more question here. Someone still got a question? Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
know, I just wanted to quote you from your book. Uh, being first class citizen of the court base also means it should be voting controlled along with the court. Yes, yes correct. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, so this guy at the front said, you know, you should be version controlling your both your acceptance criteria and your test code along with uh, the production code. Absolutely. And you have, yeah. And uh, so when you use the natural language to express your intent and a general purpose programming language to express your mechanics, you need a tool that can allow you to operate seamlessly in either domain. Uh, and I'll show you one, but this is by no means the only kind of tool out there. I mean, even Cucumber allows you to do some, Gherkin allows you to do something similar to this. Cucumber, Gherkin, there's a .NET one that's just come out that I've forgotten the name of that's open source. Um, sorry, I should have written that down. Yeah. Specflow. Specflow. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's the one. Uh, However, we are going to show you. We're going to show you a product that uh, that we, we build have. called Twist. So this is um, this is an actual test uh, intent written out in pure English, uh, uh, and you'll see that I can actually execute it. Hit the execute button, and I can start executing this test. Uh, this is actually using Sahi underneath the covers in order to do the navigation and the browser workflow and stuff like that. And uh, you will see that as the test goes through and each step goes green there's actual navigation happening in the browser, but we're not looking at Java code executing. Right, so what we're looking at is the actual user's journey through the application going red or green, and what's happening underneath the covers is it's getting translated into Java code. Uh, if anybody's interested, I don't want to make this into a product demo, but if anybody's more interested in how something like this can be achieved, uh, I can always talk to you after the talk. But that was the core idea that I wanted to express is that you would express your intention in uh, a regular language, and you'd be able to automate that as well. So uh, that was about structuring your intentions. Now about structuring mechanics, uh, there is a, a very well-known pattern called the page object pattern. How many people here have come across this before? Right. So the, that's, that's fewer people than I would have usually expected. It's actually there on the Selenium website itself. Uh, they uh, mention this. It's not without its problems, but it's certainly a much better uh, way of structuring mechanics than not having one. Um, the, uh, so what the idea basically is, is that every page or part of your page which has a user interaction can actually be expressed as an object which understands how to uh, operate on that page. So things like you know, the identifier for the login field, uh, the ID for the password field, uh, the name of the form, and things like that are put in one place. So if you're going to make a change to this one page, you don't have to wonder all the places in which this code could be littered, all the places in which the string could be littered. Uh, there's one place in which you go to find it. The other interesting thing is you'll notice that um, each page object, so this is the login page object, uh, it returns, uh, when you perform an operation, what it returns is another page object which basically tells you what the flow through the application is. So the login page upon successful login will return a home page object and from there on you'll be able to navigate through the op uh, application as well, um, each uh, operation returning uh, another page object in return. Um, the one thing that you don't see over here, and quite deliberately so, is assertions. Um, assertions are clearly meant to be out of the page objects themselves uh, and expressed in your tests and not necessarily expressed inside of the page objects. These are for purely for representing flow uh, for the most part. Yes? yes. So, in the, so in the page object, if you did, did want to have an assertion somewhere else, you'd have you know, essentially a getter in the page object? You typically have a getter. In, so if you wanted to assert, for example, when there's a login expecting an error, if there's an error message that you expect on that page, you'd have a getter on the login page object to return a login error to you, and you'd assert that the login error message that you get from the page object is what you expect it to be. And that way you don't leak the identifiers or classes and things like that out of the page object while still getting the benefit of being able to uh, keep your flow separate from your assertions. So this encapsulates the interaction of the test harness with the system under test. And what that means is it it removes this problem where you know you change a link somewhere and it breaks a bunch of tests and then you know the, the implementation uh, that coupling is expressed in all those tests and you have to go and mm -hmm. change all of them with this you only have to change it in one place which is in the page object and that makes your tests much less brittle and, and flaky in the long term. Um, it also is useful you can actually express this as an interface and have multiple implementations so you could have a page object <coughs> implementation that interacts with your ui and you could have a different implementation that interacts with the service layer. And what that allows you to do is run your complete suite of tests against the UI or against the service layer uh, by just changing out which implementation of the page objects you use. Uh -huh. So you could have the same set of acceptance criteria 
And you could say, okay, I want to run this against the service layer because it's going to be quicker. I'm going to get faster feedback, but the feedback's not going to be as comprehensive. And then you could run a subset of your tests against the UI, and um, that, that would take longer and potentially be more flaky. But you don't have to decide that up front. Mm -hmm. You can decide that dynamically at the time you run the tests just by having a, by using this pattern to encapsulate the interaction with the harness with the system on the test, and B, by having multiple implementations. You could write a third implementation to interact with an iPhone client um, or you know, some other user interface for the same system. Mm -hmm. It's a really powerful technique. Mm -hmm. So um, given that, are we going to talk about, yeah, you've got a question? Uh, yeah. Could you go slide back? Oh, sure. OK. Uh, do we need to unit test this code because it can contain all sorts mistakes like I forgot to type a password and the deny page submits the user without a password? <laughs> so this, this is an excellent question. question. Do, do, you need to test, question. do you need to test your tests is the question. <laughs> unit test. Unit test. Do you need to unit test your acceptance test code? Uh, but it, it, it's, it kind of, I would advise against it. If you have the level of complexity, that you need to actually write a unit test. So it's one thing whether you want to do test-driven development of your test code base, or whether you want to just put a unit test so that you don't uh, you know, accidentally fat finger a, a, you know, an identifier. Fact is, this is not built in isolation. It's going to be built in order to run something. So the minute you write it and you try to run those tests, it should tell you immediately whether it's working or not. Um, and once that is done, you should, not have, you should not have complex logic inside your page object. If you, have, uh, if you are doing that, it probably means that your application workflow itself is really complicated, even from a user perspective. If by you know, clicking a checkbox over there and p selecting a radio button over here, three different fields just become visible and editable over here, that's not exactly the best experience from a customer's perspective either. If fields are just going randomly you know, editable and not. So if you need to use uh, conditional logic or complex logic inside here to solve those kinds of problems, it's probably an indication of a smell from a UX perspective. And that's a theme that we'll be coming back to in the rest of the talk as well. The other thing from a more philosophical level, Bob Martin often talks about the test suite and the system under test as being like double entry accounting, that the one keeps tabs on the other and vice versa. So you do have <coughs> tests for your acceptance tests. That's your working production system. That's what validates that your test suite is correct. So the, these, the system on a test and the test harness are complementary in that sense, and they kind of keep a check on each other. In my personal experience, in my personal so, experience. So what, what, are the, what are the problems is the question. What are the potential problems with this pattern? Yeah. The only thing that I have come across is that it's not possible to cleanly express conditional workflows from this, so if by performing one operation, you can get taken to one of two different pages, uh, it's not completely easy to express that flow over here. You can do it, you can simulate it, similar to what we've done over here, logging in and logging in with an error, um, and that is one workaround. Uh, and so there are well-known workarounds for those kinds of things, but I find it a little, little more awkward to express conditional flows, but that's really the only problem that I've come across. Uh, there are anti-patterns to using it, but there are no fundamental problems in it itself, apart from this one little niggly thing. In other words, you can do this wrong, but if yeah. you do it right, then it's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is true of most things which in is, life. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, here you've got the Selenium. You're using the browser, but yep. you said that this pattern works well also if you don't want to do browser-based testing. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, yes. what you would do is you would these would be calls to the service layer of the system, yep. the API calls. You'd get some sort of a service facade in as your constructor argument, and then you'd be able to make calls on that. Um, I, put, I put the Selenium session in only to concretize it. The fact is it doesn't, it's not related to Selenium. You get some sort of a driver. The page object encapsulates the driver, and through the uh, methods on, public methods on the page object, you control the driver. And if you're doing a service level test, the driver would be some sort of a service facade that can make the requisite service calls. Any other questions on this? How do you deal with one-page apps and Ajax apps and this kind of thing is the question. So we'll come to Ajax-based apps in just a little bit. Uh, there are a couple of patterns. It's not, it's not that the page object does not apply, uh, but I've not particularly used page objects to actually test those kinds of systems. I've typically used this when the, uh, when the system under test has got multiple pages and explicit flows. Um, 
I have tested those kinds of systems in different ways, and when I come to that, I can maybe talk about that, but if you want to know specifically how you could apply the page object pattern to those kinds of applications, I have not had experience doing that. Um, has anyone else had experience doing this? Doing single page? Okay, speak to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the idea is the same. You just use um, the page objects to represent logical, logical portions of your application, not necessarily, not necessarily having to be different URLs. Okay, that, that's, that's really great. Uh, so what he said for people at the back is just use page objects to represent logical flows uh, or logical units of your, your page rather than having different URIs for each, uh, each page. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about team structure and team flow and how you actually, you know, in the process of working, taking a story from uh, analysis to dev complete, what the various roles are and how they interact when you create an acceptance test. So you have, uh, as we discussed earlier, you should be splitting your acceptance test into the acceptance criteria uh, or the journeys, the, the natural language part and then the implementation, which is code, obviously. So the natural language acceptance criteria um, or the, the flow for the story, uh, for, the, for the test, should be written before development starts by the customer and the tester working together. Now, you know, these are roles, not people. Um, so I'm not saying there must be a tester on your project and there must be a customer on your project. These are roles, right? And, and it could be it could be that you have a developer who plays a tester role or a BA who plays a tester role. The important thing is there is someone whose role it is to, to, to be a tester who will write these things. So customers and testers together should write the acceptance criteria, the natural language flow of the uh, test before development starts. And then once development starts, but before you can be dev complete, you need to write the actual implementation of the test, the part underneath. Um, the actual code that interacts with the system on the test that makes the, uh, the test pass. And this should be done by developers and testers working together. And by working together, I mean pairing, normally. So you should actually physically have developers and testers sitting together at the laptop um, or the, the workstation or whatever it is, um, writing the implementation of the test together. Uh, because they're, they're two different roles. The, I mean, a tester's job is to understand the quality of the system and to be an advocate for the user, and um, they know how to structure tests correctly and, and, and which acceptance criteria they've selected for the test, um, and so they bring that to the table. The developer brings the knowledge about how to structure code well, uh, how to uh, do encapsulation, how to do refactoring, all those kinds of things to the table. Now, you may have someone who is capable of doing both these things, and that's great, but it's by no means mandatory. We don't, we're not saying that testers should know how to do refactoring and write code, and we're certainly not saying that developers should understand how to structure test suites uh, well and write user journeys and, and behave like a user. So these two roles need to work together to write the test implementation. And before you can say that, I mean, and this is why outsourcing your testing is a really horrible idea, because you can't do this. I mean, there might be developers working in the organization that is writing the acceptance tests, but you really need that knowledge to be on the same team as the people who are writing the system under test. I mean, it, it's, it's really important because this knowledge, the knowledge that you develop in the process of writing the acceptance tests is actually really important for the developers of the application to understand because you'll learn things in the course of implementing the tests about the application. You, you'll realize, oh, this doesn't work. If someone actually uses this, it's going to be really horrible. You're going to discover things that are going to feed back into the actual requirements for the system. And so if these people aren't physically talking to the people, to the product owner, to the analyst, to the customers, hopefully, and interacting in the course of creating these test suites, you've lost a really important opportunity for actually making your software better. Uh, and, and that's really important for quality. So another reason why it's really horrible to have a different part of the organization or a different organization doing the acceptance tests. Yes. Right, so, I mean, 
everyone's laughing because it's so ludicrous. But what this guy is saying, and this is very common, is that you know, we have to separate the testers from the developers because if they talk to each other, they might make friends and then they might lose all their judgment and not be able to think properly. I mean, are we eight? It's, it's, oh, it makes me so mad. It's total nonsense. And we see this over and over again in organizations. It's, I mean, this idea of segregation of duties, yeah. separation of concerns. We have to separate the developers from the operations people. So the operations people act as a set of checks and balances on the developers and make sure they don't do anything stupid. And it's like, you know, this is supposed to be a risk management strategy. It's the worst risk management strategy ever invented. It's, it's, awful because what it means is that you actually that these people can't talk to each other so they can't exchange information so the the testers when they're like oh there's something this this is really horrible and it doesn't work properly and no one's going to use it and and this information doesn't get back to the developers and it doesn't get back to to the rest of the organization and so they implement a really crappy app that no one wants to use so yes you know if developers and testers sit together they might talk to each other and collaborate and, and, and then you might have actually a high quality system that people really want to use, uh, but let's not do that because you know, let's treat all our employees as children who are incapable of using their judgment and, and that, that'll create a much higher quality application. I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> Sorry? Don't treat your employees like they're children. I mean, it's not true that setting up an adversarial relationship somehow automatically uh, brings quality into the organization. At, mo at worst, uh, it just prevents any flow of information and anything from getting done. And at best, it makes things just move really, really slowly and makes people be enemies with each other and you don't like going into work on a daily basis because the QAs think that the developers are a bunch of cowboys who are just sending bugs their way. And the developers think the QAs don't know anything about what they're building and reject any bug that they log. And that's not ensuring quality if you, all you have is this sort of contention. What you want is for a dialogue to be able to happen and everybody to be able to come to the same page and understand why you're building this application and build quality in from the team upwards. So, so yeah, now I've calmed down a bit. I mean, that's, that's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. And you that, haven't that, even <laughs> had your second coffee yet. Know, it's, 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 only, it's only 9.30 and I've already become enraged. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that, that's one good reason that adversarial relationships are, are actually really bad in, in, in you know, enabling high quality. The other reason is the cycle time thing. So one of the things, if anyone came to my talk yesterday and knows about continuous <coughs> delivery and lean software development in general, one of the things we want to optimize for is cycle time. And cycle time is really important, being able to go from check-in to release as fast as possible. That's one of the most, possibly the most important measure of the effectiveness of your delivery process. And what happens when you have silos and you separate people is it, I mean, it's, just impossible to create, uh, to, to, to get short cycle times. And what that means, James Whitaker wrote a book called uh, How We Test at Google, which I haven't read, but I read an interview with him about it, uh, which is normally what I do and I can't be bothered to read the book. And <laughs> so what, what, one of the things that he says is that at Google, they don't do exhaustive exploratory testing anymore because it only takes them hours to get a bug fix out. So they do some exploratory testing, but they don't do it exhaustively. And what that allows them to do is they, they focus on really great, um, really great bug reporting. So it's really easy for users to report bugs. Um, and so they report bugs and then you can just fix it and push it out there. So their process of fixing bugs and putting fixes out is, is really, really quick. And that, you know, creating a resilient system for delivering software is more important than <coughs> building in all this phase gate stuff to, to build quality in. Because what happens is you can't respond to your users effectively. And that's really important in creating good quality software. And where you have this separation, and the separation inevitably creates an adversarial relationship, and that inevitably telescopes the cycle time, and it becomes impossible to create an efficient delivery process. And then you end up with all the problems of, of you know, long cycle times, which is that it's impossible to create high quality, valuable software. So that, that's kind of the uh, more kind of intellectual, philosophical argument that rather than pissing your manager off by and, telling them. And, and not to badger on for too long about the same point, but it, can, it is possible for a group of people to be called testers or the testing organization within your company. And that is there because they might be working on different teams, they might want to share their experiences, they might want to learn from each other, they might, they might come together on a regular basis to, uh, to talk about the state of the art on their respective teams. That is different. To have testing as a practice and people identify with that practice is a different thing. 
to set it up as a separate team which lives in a separate building or in a separate room. Now, that is where the problems really start to happen. So when you're doing it so that you can actually encourage the formation of a practice and uh, communication of that, uh, of the best practices of that within your organization, that's a good way to go about it. But to do it on a, uh, to, to put a Chinese wall around it, uh, that's really not the best way to approach this. It's, it's a classic case of people just reifying these uh, kind of, a, these functional areas and, and also these skill sets, you know, just because you have people working together in a cross-functional way doesn't mean you can't have groups of practice, uh, and that's a sensible thing to do. Recently, we had an experience working with Google, and they have a separate group for SAP. Yeah. SAP mm -hmm. is Software Engineers Test. Mm -hmm. So they're ba basically developers, not, not testers, who develop <coughs> But do they and sit? And they sit separately. It's the testers of using the actually uh, you know, using the platform or the software that is created by SAP. So that uh, right. So, but what you're talking about is people creating frameworks yeah. for the developers yeah. to yeah. use, right. Right. and that's fine. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're creating frameworks and tools for the developers to use, and there's a separate group creating those frameworks and tools, I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Basically, what they're doing is creating a product yeah. which is consumed by the teams building the yeah. actual software. Yeah. And that, then we, we don't have a problem with that. Yeah. I mean, that's like the Selenium developers aren't going to sit with every Selenium user. The you know the web driver developers aren't going to sit with every web driver user. So that's slightly different from what we're talking about here. Yes. I, I was just going to say, your model here, right, has basically that the developers are the ones that are coding the tasks. I mean, they're actually implementing the tasks. So kind of related to this, one handy pattern I've seen is where they will hire specific automation engineers that will write the tests separate from the developers writing the code. And sometimes sets or other people like that, specifically automation engineers, now you have people that don't write the code writing Okay, so um, this is John at the front here, um, and he says that uh, he's seen it, uh, a situation where people hire separate automation engineers to write the code for the tests who are not the same people as the developers who write the software, and that's been problematic in your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and that stems from the fact that there was always a, a separate set of tools that people used for test automation, and people became experts at those tools. It's, it's kind of like having a What's that horrible SharePoint? It's mm -hmm. like having SharePoint engineers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But yep. but they're they're QTP engineers, you know, and <laughs> so <laughs> just so we're not recording this. Um, <laughs> I think we've just made enemies in every organization in the world. Well, e e even people from Microsoft have got to admit that SharePoint's horrible. I mean, you know, I, I, Microsoft's done lots of great things. SharePoint isn't one of them, you know. Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, I think that, that's a problem. It, uh, and you can see why that's happened. But, uh, and again, I, I just want to emphasize, these are roles, they're not people. You might have the same person doing both. You might not. I mean, mm -hmm. You might, it, it's just skills. Moving on. So, uh, we've kind of talked a bit, I just want to kind of go over what the role of tester, stroke quality analyst is uh, for us. Obviously, it's a role, not a person. There may be people whose primary job it is to carry out this role, and that's fine. Um, Testers are not failed developers. Oh, yeah. Now, this is, you know. <laughs> this is really the saddest thing I've seen. The saddest. It, it's, it's so awful. And it's, it's, it's usually something that developers think in their heads when they're working with testers. But it does disservice to both, both parties. It does disservice to both developers and to testers. It pretends as if, if you are a bad developer, you could become a tester, thereby testing is not something that needs talent. Or that if you are a tester, you're incapable of development, so all you need is third-rate development skills. So, I mean, neither of these statements is true, and yet people continue to believe this, and this is so sad. It depresses the hell out of me when I hear people say that. So what, what are testers? Um, I think there's, there's two things that testers do. Um, firstly, they're advocates for the user. They represent, I mean, they're, they're the people who are putting themselves in the shoes of the users of the system and thinking about what they might do and the kind of ways they might want to interact with the system. And the corollary of this is that they're really important for analysis of requirements. 
because the job of the tester is to, to think about how the user will interact with the system. They're going to interact with the system and go, well, this is really horrible, and this is really unpleasant. And as I said earlier, you know, that, that should go back to the requirements. And you, know, you might want to talk to the people who are analyzing or the customers and say, well, listen, this isn't going to work. We need to think through this and, and come up with a different way of doing this. So I mean, <coughs> this is why siloization is so horrible. So, so testers have an important role in actually creating requirements. Uh, and they make the quality of the system transparent. So I'm going to talk a bit later about quality and, and what it is. But their job is not to own the quality of the system, but to make the quality of the system transparent so that the team as a whole can make decisions about what to do. If your testers are primarily working on manual regression testing, wake up. It's 2012. We shouldn't be doing this anymore. Regression testing should be mainly uh, in fact, fully automated, let's, let's be fair. Um, so th this is not the job of testers. What they should be doing is exploratory testing and helping to create and maintain the automated acceptance test. So that should be most of the work of uh, what testers do, in our opinion. Uh, and helping to run showcases um, and helping with usability testing, uh, stuff like that. So. Um, you can't say that you're done with a piece of work, story, bug fix, unless you have passing acceptance tests that prove it. So dev complete, I mean, it's kind of a meaningless term, but in as much as it means anything, you shouldn't be able to say that you're dev complete unless you have passing automated acceptance tests and unit tests, obviously, that, that actually give some credibility to this claim. And they shouldn't be running on the developer box. They should be running on the CI box. Encapsulation is really important. You want to encapsulate the interaction between the test harness and the system under test um, using the page object model because that's how you avoid horrible flaky tests that become brittle over time. Um, and the acceptance tests are everybody's responsibility, not the responsibility of the testers. Principle two, always interact with the system under test the same way a user would. So that usually means running tests, uh, or is n usually interpreted to mean running tests through the UI. But uh, you know, th this is often what people respond. They say, well, that's, that's all very nice, but browser-based tests are nasty and flaky. Yep. So it's funny, because it commonly manifests itself as this problem. Because every time you say, run it like a user would, everybody assumes that it means only one thing, and that's running it through the browser. But it's, and yes, it does mean that, but it means something more than that as well. And, um, Really, I mean, the, so the, the symptoms are, you know, when, when a statement like this bubbles up in the development team, the test fails, but when I run the app, uh, it seems to be working fine, so what gives? Um, and it's usually an indication that uh, the mechanics of the test are different from how the user who's using the application uh, would actually go about uh, the sequence of steps. Um, and usually comes up in highly JavaScript-based applications and Ajax-based applications, though not necessarily in those places alone. And uh, so obviously, so things that need non-zero processing time. So you might think that on your developer workstation with, I don't know, 16 cores and the latest processor from Intel and, like and, and not the internet truck truckloads in of RAM and no internet between you uh, and the server, that when you click a link, it's instantaneous uh, and something comes up. Uh, and it might not be the case in the CI environment, uh, which would probably run in a slightly more realistic uh, scenario. Um, so there are some solutions to uh, this sort of a problem. Uh, they go down to the underlying mechanics. Um, so. Once again, just restating that, and what does that really mean? Uh, understand when behavior is asynchronous and account for it explicitly. So understand that when you click something or when you submit something, uh, even though it looks like it fades instantaneously and you're given a notice message, that that does not happen instantaneously. There's an amount of time. Wait for that thing that you need to see. For ex if a user was running through your application, and if they were starting an Ajax activity, typically the user does not do anything else until they see the spinner disappear. We've become conditioned over years of using Ajax-based applications to look for the spinner. Once the spinner disappears, we do something else. Do that in your test. And then you'll suddenly see that your tests are all of a sudden a little bit more reliable. Uh, user clicks a JavaScript-based dropdown, and it shows up. Wait for the dropdown pane to show up. I mean, it seems a bit obvious to say this, but I've seen plenty of testing code bases in which there's a click, there's no wait, and all of a sudden somebody is test, you know, selecting the third value from the dropdown. And that this is a leading cause of flaky tests. Right. Another, another one is they'll put in explicit, explicit wait. Ah. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. In fact, that is exactly what that point is. That brings us neatly to our next is. point. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what that point is. If there is ever a thread dot sleep in your test code, forget about it. You might as well just throw it out of the, throw it out of the window and start over again. Seriously, that is the kiss of death for any code base. I mean, it's, it's terrible in production code, and it's even worse in testing code because it leads to false positives and false negatives, which are the worst information you can get from your test. And then you see hilarious things like people are like, oh, we've got lots of seats. Let's extract out a constant. Yeah. And they extract out a constant yeah. for the max for sleep the time. Max, max, or, or just sleep time, right? And, yeah. and, then, you know, and then someone will increase it because the test failed. And before you know it, it's 10 seconds, and people are wondering why your 20 acceptance tests take five hours to run. Yeah. And, so and still fail randomly. And still fail randomly. <laughs> and, and so, you know, have a max sleep time, which is, uh, and then poll every, you know, 100 milliseconds yeah. or something until the max sleep time, which is, you know, two seconds yeah. or some other time out, do, do yeah. that. Um, or better still, if you can, if you have an event-driven system, and Ajax enables this, mm -hmm. and JavaScript, uh, most JavaScript frameworks are event-driven, hook into that. Hook into those events and, and, and make your test harness receive events to yeah. tell it when to proceed. And we'll, I'll give you a code example of that in just a bit. Uh, and then one last point is, if you find it hard to write the test, uh, as, as a person who's working, the developer QA pair working together to write the test, uh, what's missing is an application level feature which makes the application testable. And that is not the opportunity to write a flaky test or put it or throw in a random Sorry, speed. it says, if it's hard to write the test, you need to have a conversation with the team. So what's missing at that point is that conversation where you need to go back to the team and say, well, this page is not testable. How do I know that this particular activity has finished? How does the user know that this particular activity has finished? If my testing framework cannot make the decision, then most likely the user cannot either. So give me something that I can test with. And, and that, that, this is another reason why you want developers pairing with testers. Yeah. Yeah, and this sort of conversation just will not happen if it's somebody else's responsibility to write the test. They will just write something that works instead of having this conversation which says, well, I find it hard to test. How can we make it easier to test the application? Well, did you have a question at the back there? Sorry? No, I was just going to say exactly what you just said a while back. Uh huh. Okay. Which was that, you know, when you add those um, positive and negative feelings, you yes. know, minutes and you know, time. Yep. 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 Yeah, we've all seen that, right? I mean, it's so common. There's a question back here. Multiple browsers is a whole other kettle of fish. I mean, our, our acceptance test suite runs against both Firefox and IE, and I know how difficult that can be. Um, so if you want to know about how to deal with IE-specific quirks and how to get acceptance tests running reliably on IE, um, maybe we can. I don't think there's a definite one pattern for it. It's, but there's uh, a whole session on that, right? a, We can do a whole session on that, but if you want to just chat with me after this, I'll be around for at least another couple of hours so we can have a conversation offline. Anybody else who's interested as well? Yeah. Great question. Mm -hmm. So when, when we say this, are we saying that you should be hacking your application to add all these hooks for the tests, and that's going to result in lots of extra code and nasty unmaintainable application? You should never add backdoors for your tests to make them work. What we're saying is fix your, fix your architecture of your system. Testability is a, is a requirement for your architecture. So we're not saying add some backdoors so the tests work. What we're saying is fix your actual application so that you can test it in the same way that the user would. I mean, it goes back to the principle, which is interact with the system the way a user would. So if you're introducing backdoors for the test to work, you're not interacting with the system the way a user would. So we're absolutely not recommending that. Thanks for the clarification. We're saying that you need to actually fix the real production code so the test can interact with it the same way that a user would. I mean, you, these might start out as tactical conversations, but eventually they need to result in a strategic direction for your application. The, it's not just a grab bag of tactical decisions that you make in an ad hoc way and throw into your application saying, a class here, a class there, a hidden field here, and a hidden field there. It's not just about that. It's about making that be a principle for how you design your application and using that to drive requirements forward. Uh, yes? Are you going to talk to head with browsers? Uh, now, not specifically. Okay. Did you want to bring that up? Well, Yeah. 
it is it is a good option. And so for the people at the back, the question is, do we recommend headless browsers? Um, um, I've I've started using them more frequently now. The the implementations are a bit more stable now. Um, they were not about two years ago. So the situation is rapidly changing, um, and I think it's still pretty much at the cutting edge of what you can do with acceptance tests. Um, but we can have a, another conversation with that perhaps later. We don't we don't bring it up explicitly in this talk now. But if you, I mean, the other thing you can do is, like I say, use the page of pattern and run against the service layer. And, and that might, I mean, the other thing you could do if you're not using JavaScript heavy apps is use HTTP client or HTTP unit and just uh, pull the uh, HTML down and, and, and parse that rather than interacting directly with the browser. That's another mm -hmm. common technique, but obviously it depends on you not putting a lot of logic in the JavaScript. So... Uh, a couple of libraries that actually make it easier for you to do this. There's this library called uh, Wait Utils, which has been written by a thought worker. It's ridiculously simple and useful at the same time. The best kind of libraries. It's like less than 100 lines of Java code. All that it provides you is a block with a callback, and it waits for whatever condition you ask it to wait for. So put your condition in, the thing that you want to see, the thing that you want to stop happening on the screen, and then proceed. And Wait Utils allows you to do that really easily. Um, we'll post the slide deck up so that you can get a handle to the uh, GitHub URL. Yeah, if you go to slideshare.net slash um, Jez Humble or look for Jez Humble on Slideshare, we'll put these slides up um, in the next day or so. Yep. And for Ajax-based tests, uh, this is a very wordy statement, so I'll just explain what it means. Uh, for typically, if, you use, if your application is Ajax heavy or using any, uh, some sort of JavaScript framework, JavaScript frameworks typically provide you some sort of callback when you're constructing Ajax objects, hook into that. Jez briefly touched upon it. I'll give you an example of what this means. Um, can everybody see the code? Sorry if okay. it's not clear from the it's, back. It's, uh, but I'll explain briefly what it's doing. Um, this is a, a, a JavaScript object which contains a bunch of callbacks. Uh, on creation, um, it keeps an array. And on creation, it basically pushes the request URL into the array. On completion of the Ajax request, it removes that uh, URL from the array. And uh, there is a getter on this object which says all Ajax complete, which basically checks to see if the pending request count is zero. So every time you start an Ajax call, the count keeps going up. Every time you finish an Ajax call, the count keeps coming down. And when you reach zero, it means all Ajax activity is complete. Hook this up as a callback listener into your Ajax framework like prototype or uh, jQuery. And what you have is a very simple way to have reliable um, knowing uh, knowledge about when all Ajax activity is completed and the ability to proceed forward from that point on. And if you can't read that from the back, as I say, we'll put the slides up. Uh, this is on. There's a gist as well. There's a GitHub gist as well, so you'll be able to get the handle to that. So uh, gist.github.com slash 3315690. So moving forward. Um, so remember, make time to go back and refactor your tests. Um, use layers and encapsulation and separate high level intent and low level mechanisms. And use page object pattern to deal with the system under test, run against the service layer when possible and um, test like the user would use the system. So principle three, you need to continuously curate the structure of your test suites. So here's what I mean by this. You start with you know, a story for your new shiny app to uh, deliver goods to the world. And you, know, you start with, as a, uh, I want, uh, so that, uh, and given when then, given when, uh, when uh, and so you've got these acceptance criteria, um, bada bing, bada boom. And you write your acceptance test based on these acceptance criteria. Uh, and we should say we don't necessarily advocate automating all the acceptance criteria. That's a decision that the testers should make, which acceptance criteria to automate. Um, because uh, and we'll explain why later. Um, so you've got, some, you've got a suite. You've got a test suite for this story. And then you know, the next story comes along, and you write a test suite for that story. Uh, fast forward about six months. <laughs> Gosh, that's a lot of stories. And we have all these test suites, one for each story. That's really horrible, um, because what's happened is your test suites don't tell you anything about the application. What it tells you is the story of how the application was created. It's like, it's like you're building a building, and you have scaffolding. And the test suite is basically, it's like, here's the scaffolding. Uh, that's really unhelpful. Uh, and it's really unmaintainable. And what happens is, you know, an acceptance test breaks. And one of the reasons why an acceptance test might break is because you've actually changed the requirements of the system. And you go back to that acceptance test and go, oh, that acceptance test was for story 1315, which we wrote six months ago. And 
the system, I mean, <laughs> that story doesn't apply anymore uh, because the system's functionality has changed. And, and so you're going back and you're looking at, you're doing archaeology, basically. And, and it, you end up with a lot of failures for that reason because the, the requirements of the system have changed, but you've got all these old test suites which reflect how the application used to behave X number of months ago. Uh, and, and a lot of uh, failures become due to that. So, uh, and also the test suite becomes really hard to understand uh, and deal with. Uh, and so that dissuades people from maintaining it effectively. So instead of that, what we recommend is creating journey tests. <coughs> so every test suite should, should reflect a journey of the user through the system. So we talk about interacting with the system on the test the same way a user would, not just in the test implementation, but also at the test suite level. So you want to buy a product. There's a bunch of different steps. You search the product catalog for a particular product, add it to your cart, check out. You create an account, provide your various details, complete the order, and then you verify the order was created and that the credit card was debited and that you got an email saying your order has been accepted. Um, that, that would be an example of an acceptance test, which represents a journey through the app. And so we add a new story. The story is that you want to add a gift wrap option. Do not create a new test suite for the story for adding a gift wrap option. Instead, go back and look at your existing journeys and think, well, what do I need to do? Do I need to add something to an existing one? It may be that you do actually need to create a new suite because there's a new important high value journey through the application. But as you move on, in the, as your app evolves, that becomes less and less likely over time. Most of the stuff you're going to be doing is, is editing existing ones. So what we do here is change our user journey for buying a product to add the bits around select the gift wrapping option, make sure that the gift wrapping option uh, was uh, written in the email that you got when the order was accepted. Uh, so this is what you should be doing. And this is another important role of testers to understand what the journeys are in the test suite, and when a new requirement or story comes along, to think about, okay, what are we going to need to change in our test suite to be able to accommodate the acceptance criteria that we want to automate for this particular story? And that's a discussion that needs to happen before implementation. Um, so if you, yes? So if you have, uh, so here we have, uh, you know, verified order created. If you also want to handle the case where the order wasn't created, mm. you have another journey mm. to It's a fourth a point. Right? Yeah, a fourth point, exactly. It does. And in fact, we will... Sorry, so let's repeat the question. Sure. The question was, uh, so we've highlighted a, a journey through the system over here. It's quite logical that, uh, to expect that a lot of these steps in the journey would have branching points. You, it would not lead to the immediate next step, except in the happiest of the happy case scenarios. So, so the terminology around this, this is a happy path. There are alternate happy paths which represent different journeys that are successful. There's yeah. also what are charmingly named sad paths, <laughs> uh, which is uh, a journey which ends in disaster or ignominy. Mm. The server burning down. Um, and uh, yes, so would we recommend creating a journey for all of those? Well, that's a decision that needs to be made on a per application basis. You need to decide what the high value paths are. Similar to what Jess just mentioned, some people might find that detailed, exhaustive, exploratory exploratory testing of every nook and cranny of your application may not be necessary. Because if the user can only get to that on the third Sunday of every month of a year that ends in 38, uh, yes, so there's a bug there, but really what is the value in fixing it and how likely is it that somebody's gonna stumble upon it? Oh, so, although you've got to be careful with that, you know, as the leap second demonstrated. Well, yes, sure. But then uh, you've got to be, well, you've got to think about it. You've got to think about it, but then it's a decision that you make in your application on a per application basis. There is no one standard answer to that. I mean, so people get very religious about this. Some people say you must have automated tests for every possible happy path and all the sad paths, and you have to automate everything. Um, and some people we actually trust and respect say this. Um, in our experience, that's normally a lot more work than the payoff. And you always have to be thinking about this. What's the cost benefit? Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, there's a cost to creating and maintaining automated acceptance suites. What's the benefit you're getting? How much would it cost you to do manual regression testing for this application uh, every time you want to release it? Uh, and you shouldn't really be looking to spend more than that um, on the creation and maintenance of your acceptance test suite. Uh, and I mean, one of the things, obviously, my background is in continuous delivery. That changes the economics of this because if you're releasing really frequently, the uh, cost of doing manual regression testing becomes astronomical. And that, so that actually means, allows you to invest a lot more a lot in more acceptance into testing. Automating your acceptance um, test. Because, you know, economically, it's justified to do that. Yes? Who defines 
defines what's valuable, what tests are valuable, hmm. Yeah, so who, who decides what's valuable, how far we should go, and yes, you provided the correct answer, it's the team who does it. Um, you know, and, and you're going to get feedback, right? You're going to release it to users, and you're going to find problems, and uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to say, well, you know, this is, again, think about the economics of it, apart from anything else. Uh, think about how much it's costing you to deal with those bugs and manage them, and, and think about, you know, maybe we should be spending more on our acceptance tests. Um, there's also uh, kind of less, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, less quantifiable things around the perception of your product. If perception of the quality of your product is really important um, to, your, to your company, then you might want to spend more than would be economically justified by the cost of the, fixing the bugs. Um, so there's all these decisions that have to be made. The important point is you should find ways to measure that information. That's actually the most important thing. Uh, there's a really great book called How to Measure Anything by Douglas Hubbard. And, um, <laughs> one of the points he makes is that uh, due to a cognitive bias, when we're tr faced with a difficult question, we, we tend to like, you know, not, not answer it and think about how we can measure something else instead. <laughs> this is why, um, I mean, this is just a, the way your brain works, right? But it's manifested in really horrible ways. So people find it difficult to measure the value of the product they're going to develop. So instead, they measure the cost because that's much easier. And so we say, oh, that's going to be expensive. One of the things that Doug Hubbard points out is the information value of the cost of developing a product is almost zero compared to the information value of how much this product is going to deliver in value. Because hopefully, I mean, if your product isn't delivering a huge return on investment, it's kind of pointless to build it. Anyway, that's a diversion. Think about the economics, measure that stuff, and then you can hopefully come to a rational decision as a team. You may find uh, other organizations where a very, very snap answer to that is the product owner, and um, resist the temptation to give that answer all the time in all the teams. Um, you may want to. Even if it is the product owner that's making the decision, make sure that the reasons for making that decision and the information that has been gathered in order to help you make that decision are shared with the entire team so that the context is shared and does not rest exclusively in one person, even if the decision is finally made by one person. The product owners can be wrong, it turns out. Yeah. Who knew? The journey, yes, so we showed you the tool earlier, uh, Twist, or you could use Cucumber or whatever the .NET thing is, I've already forgotten it. Specflow. Specflow, that's how much I love .NET. And uh, I mean, so you keep the, the, this test stuff as text files checked into version control. And the implementation of those tests is also code, which is checked into version control. And uh, you, the tool will link those two up uh, uh, when you actually run the tests. So yes, you can print it out, but the canonical copy should yeah. be in version control. Yeah. And you know, these things are actually executable kind of, code. Huh? They're executable. They're, the they're the executable, but they're also like requirements. So this is documentation. Um, so you know, don't keep the documentation and requirements in one place and yeah. separate it from this. Yeah. That, that's bad. In the same way that you'd not keep a UML design of your application on the wall and let your application diverge from it, you'd express the design of your application in the code you would not put this up on a wall and let the implementation of your mechanics diverge from this journey either. You'd keep this in version control. Okay, second question about, uh, let's assume that OIT trade card details is part of multiple journeys, right? It's a central point. Would you, do you decide to use them in multiple journeys? Like, would that test be run for each of the journeys? Or how would you do so, so if you have repetition, the question is, if you have repetition between journeys, um, how do you deal with uh, you know, having the same step in multiple journeys? Uh, different tools provide the answer in different ways. There, by all accounts, you should be able to extract these four statements over here into a separate subflow and call out to that subflow from here. Um, the tool we just demoed can do that. Uh, other tools can do that in different ways. But really, that's what you need to be able to do. And if your tool doesn't do that, then that's just uh, a feature missing in the tool as of today. Believe me, it'll come in soon enough because people realize the need for this. Anybody who's done testing will know that there's a need for that. So there needs to be a way to extract subflows and f flow into them and then flow back out of them into the main flow. This is one of the limitations of FIT that led to creation of a bunch of other frameworks because FIT couldn't do this. Yeah. This is an extra this question. So we will have multiple tests like this. Mm -hmm.
So, so this is a great question. Yeah. How do you manage isolation? You would think that if you run this test, you, can, you can't run any, any other tests at the same time against the app. That means you've done it wrong. You should be able to run as many scenarios as you want, even the same scenario from multiple different clients at the same time against the system under test. That should be part of the design of your test harness. Yeah. It should allow for multiple instances of the same test and multiple tests to be run simultaneously against the system under test. And we'll come to how you do that later. Because at the end of the day, real users will be doing that. There will be two users who are trying to buy the last product left in your inventory. And you need to be able to handle that in your application. Not catching that in your test suite in the name of isolation is just deferring a problem until it actually happens in production. And it also makes it impossible to parallelize your tests. And it's what really about, important. What about failed tests? The one failed and that's the others were not tested. We'll get to cascading failures in a bit. OK. Uh, we're going to have to speed up because you've only yeah, got yeah, 20 yeah. minutes left as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a, a debate. Uh, I think the understanding that you need to express your business logic in as simple a language as possible uh, and hidden away from the mechanics and separated from the mechanics and then weave yeah, them together. But you said, you know, let's move away from the given, you know, when Well, that's just, the, that's just the syntax, right? I mean, that is not the primary purpose of Cucumber. So you're just saying, re you know, as the new stories get added, You, you, you can express this in given when then format. Sure. It looks kind of ugly, yeah. but it's totally doable. What our point is really that you shouldn't be constrained yeah. by thinking in the given when then yeah. context. I mean, yeah. if, you, if your starting point is, oh, given when then, then it, 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 it's hard to jump intellectually from that to this. So you should always be thinking in these terms. And if your tool forces you to express it in given when then format, I mean, you can do that. But just, just don't start from the point of, I must express my acceptance criteria as given when then. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's bad. Yeah, we'll take one more question. So you said that if you write your stories at the, or at the story level, you run the risk of uh, having uh, sweet stories that reflect how you actually feel. Uh -huh. yep. <laughs> things that are a little bit in conflict because the way I felt like you should solve that problem was not by writing the test at a different level, but by writing our story in a way that more reflected the flavor of a real human. So I went to Neil Ford's talk at No Fluff on whatever it is. He said that for good story to work, you need to be in, in a trauma <coughs> state that's, that's continually deployable and with incrementally changing value. If I had that working, it seems like I would not have the problem I had where this accretion of, of story level tests became sort of meaningless, right? If, if each story truly was a deliverable feature to the customer. So the question is, in continuous delivery, it changes the way you build stories, and you tend to think more about how I can one of the acceptance criteria for a good story is, can I deliver this story and still keep trunk releasable? Uh, doesn't that uh, kind of create an alternative way to create maintainable suites of acceptance tests? Have I kind of expressed that right? Um, so I think these are two forces uh, that are both important and valuable. I'm not sure that there's a very strong connection between what we're saying and um, what continuous delivery, the effect of continuous delivery on analysis. I think you would still need to do this even if you were using, analyzing your stories in a different way. I, I think that they're independent. I mean, they might be connected, but it's not obvious to me that there's a strong force that meant if you did the continuous delivery thing, this would automatically drop out. Sorry. So, sorry, we're going to need to move a bit more quickly. Um, so, um, easy step, so a bunch of steps to go through uh, journey testing. Identify user journeys. Um, a journey is a path that the pers a persona takes through your application to achieve an end goal. Um, realize that most applications have very few distinct personas. There aren't completely random kinds of people that start using your application. And this is another feedback loop from testers back to requirements. If you find you have like all these different personas, that means that probably you haven't thought very hard about how your system will be used uh, or that there's a fault in, in the requirements for the system. Mm -hmm. And most stories in iterative development are enhancements to existing journeys. If you're truly doing iterative development and not just incremental development, uh, the distinction is expressed really clearly by Jeff Patton in his blogs, or, or if you went to see him yesterday. If you're actually doing iterative development, most stories will be enhancements and not completely new paths through the application. 
Um, here's an example. I'll run through this really quickly because we were just talking about multiple different examples. Uh, bog standard shopping cart. I've got a product catalog. I want to add things to the shopping cart. I want to gift wrap one of them. I want to check out. Uh, there's requirements for searching through the catalog, and there's requirements for paginating the search results. Um, searching might have things like if I quote words how they work, if I just put independent words how they work, and things like that. And paginating might have things about page size, what happens before the first page, what happens after the last page, what happens with an invalid page number, and things of that sort. Uh, you could write acceptance tests for all of these, and it might turn out something like that. Test that searching for friends brings back that many results, and it should include how to win friends and influence people. Testing for dead friends brings back 8,900 results, because it does an or between those two. How to win friends and influence people, and the zombie survival guide, really important book. Don't read the first one, read the second one. Uh, test that searching for dead friends in quotes only brings back uh, results, uh, which is all my friends are dead. Really good book about dinosaurs and the pain they go through. Uh, story test for pagination. <laughs> Similarly, you could come up with uh, happy tests and sad tests for each of these things, and you could come up with a story test for gift wrapping. Very, very good. So this is a way to start. Uh, a journey for this would look something like this, the journey of a user buying a book. Log in as user Bob, search for my friends in quotes, dead, that covers the oring and the quoting and the anding. Make sure that three pages of results show. That includes pagination, verifying that the previous and the next link show up and that you are on the first page currently. Verify that all my friends are dead by Avery Monson is on the first page. It seems like a relevant result. You should expect it to be on the first page. Uh, add two copies of the book to the shopping cart, gift wrap one of them, proceed to checkout. If this flow breaks, you know exactly what functionality is going to break for the user. If page minus one breaks, you're like, well, is it really important that I fix it? How often does page minus one happen in my application anyway? So it's not that you wouldn't write tests for that. This is the more important test to write. And how do you exercise these? So you've extracted a journey from your acceptance test or your story level acceptance test. Uh, you make them fast because there are going to be fewer of them. They're going to cover a flow through the application. You're not resetting your application, logging in and logging out and setting up uh, product catalogs every time you run them. So they're going to be fast. Uh, they test the most likely path that the team, the business folk, and the UX folk agree upon. And uh, they do not test every single possible path through the system. Uh, you extract the negative test and edge cases into a separate test suite, into a regression test suite uh, that runs after defining your journey test. So um, to go back to that, so uh, the one thing I want to point out over here is that when you organize your test this way, we're going to pull the rug out from under your feet a little bit. We call this, te we call this talk about acceptance tests. When you organize your tests like this across user journeys, they stop being acceptance tests. They're not about acceptance criteria for individual stories anymore. They are genuinely a test of what functionality your application has and what value it delivers to the, users. The value it delivers to your users, that's what it's telling you. Yeah. Um, and this is a general problem with the terminology in this space. Everyone means different things by all the terms. It's really annoying. Uh, we're not going to embark on a standardization effort in this talk. Um, so. Who's heard of W. Edwards Deming? <laughs> Yay. You guys are awesome. This is like the, the most hands up I've seen for all my questions. Um, so he is obviously from a manufacturing background. Um, if you don't know who he is, check him out on Wikipedia. Just such an awesome dude. Um, this is what he says about quality from a manufacturing perspective. Uh, this is the guy, for those who don't know, who is instrumental in the kind of industrial, in reindustrialization of Japan after the Second World War, who helped create a lot of the practices that were put into place in Toyota that destroyed the US auto industry. And the US auto industry hired him to tell them how the Japanese were destroying them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and there's still a, a Deming Award given out in Japan to people who contribute highly to quality in Japanese industry. So there's two important implications of this quote. Um, Number one, quality uh, testing is not something you do after dev complete. Testing is something that we're doing all the time. The cheapest way to fix a bug is not to check it into version control in the first place. You might think I'm joking, but this is why we have unit tests that we run before we check in. Um, the second important implication is that testers are not responsible for quality. Everyone is responsible for quality. And we've talked a bit about what the role of the tester is, but the role of the tester is certainly not about uh, ensuring that you build a quality product. That's everyone's responsibility. Uh, and, 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 and so that brings us on to our fourth principle, which is everyone owns acceptance tests. And this is inspired by a very common pattern where the acceptance tests break and the developers couldn't give two hoots uh, because it's the tester's problem to fix the acceptance tests. <coughs> Wrong. What happens when acceptance tests break? 
you get a developer and a tester, a couple of people, um, and they need to triage to find what the root cause is of the acceptance test failure. And there's four possibilities. It could be a problem with the environment being flaky, uh, in which case the solution is configuration management. It could be there's actually a bug in the test, um, and then you have to go and fix that bug. Um, there might be a change in the requirements of the system, and the test doesn't reflect actually what the requirements are anymore, in which case you, know, you need to go and fix that. And again, journeys are a way of minimizing that problem. Uh, or you might actually have caught a bug. It's always nice when that happens. Um, Obviously, we would prefer it if four was the most common scenario. But one of the leading causes of people not caring about the acceptance tests is that four is actually really rare or <laughs> almost non-existent uh, <laughs> when you look at acceptance test failures. So we want to stop that. Um, and there's, I mean, uh, the problem is fixing that is hard because you need to do the configuration management piece to make sure that your environments, your test environments are always identical and representative of production. Um, and you need to do the journey thing to make sure that your story tests aren't always reflecting the application six months ago. Um, so yes, fix the problem. When the acceptance tests fail, usually that means there's a missing unit test. You do not want your acceptance tests to be failing all the time. That's a sign that there's something wrong in your unit test suite. So when the acceptance tests fail, you need to add something upstream to catch that problem earlier so the acceptance tests don't have to catch it. Acceptance test failures really shouldn't be very common, um, certainly compared to unit test failures. Your unit tests should be catching most of the problems that you find. And if you can't actually test for a particular thing in your unit tests, that's, a, that's an indication there's a problem with the architecture of your application. So there's multiple kind of stages at work here, but you want to push these things upstream. And that's just generally true of the deployment pipeline in general. If there's a bug in production, that means there's a missing acceptance test. So there's a feedback loop always from you know, your users to your, from back up through the pipeline to your unit tests. There should always be stuff feeding up so you can catch problems as early as possible when they're cheaper to fix. And then you need to optimize your test suite to detect failures fast. And that normally means a comprehensive set of unit tests that run very, very fast. And you optimize your process for time to fix tests. So, I mean, in continuous integration, people are saying, well, if the build breaks often, that's really bad. The frequency of build breakage is not the metric you should be measuring. The important metric is how long it takes you to go from red to green. And, and that's what you should be optimizing for. You're optimizing for how long it takes you when your deployment pipeline, when your process, when there's a problem with your process from taking a build to production. What you want to optimize for is fixing that and getting your, your delivery process green, because otherwise you're creating function, you're writing code that might be total shit and you, you just have no idea. You're driving blind. So make sure that you have your validations always working and optimize your process for, for that. Intermittent failures. So <laughs> intermittent failures aren't useless, they're worse than useless. They add negative value, they are really, really evil. Um, but they're also very common. So what do you do when you have flaky tests? Uh, be because, I mean, when you have false, uh, false positives and false negatives, uh, people don't trust the tests anymore. And then they say, oh, sod it, we don't care about the acceptance tests. Keep in mind you can have flaky code, and you've got to tell the difference. Yes, so, I mean, going back to the root cause analysis, you know, when you have flaky tests, you don't know which of those four, when you're doing the root cause analysis, you don't know which of those four conditions obtains when you have a flaky test, and it could be any of them, right? Well, actually, it couldn't, yeah, it could be, I mean, there could be a flaky thing. So, out of memory errors, that's the cause of flaky tests, and that's the test actually catching a bug, for example. So it could be any of these four things when there's a flaky test, and you need to find out which one it is. So, what do you do uh, with flaky tests, you quarantine them. It's like having a dog with rabies. Quarantine it. So you create a separate test suite and you put flaky tests in the test suite. Um, and obviously what you want to watch out for is when your quarantine suite becomes bigger than your actual suite. That's, <laughs> at that point, you might want to stop and fix those problems. But that, I mean, you don't want to put them in forever. So, but quarantine them initially and have a separate quarantine suite. And that way, your normal non-quarantine suite is you know, people trust it. There's a bunch of different causes of non-determinism uh, of inter intermittent failures. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about them. One is interference caused by inter-test dependencies. So 
you shouldn't have tests being dependent on each other. So if test A sets up, sets up some state for test B to run, and test B sets some state up for test C to run, I go and change test A because some requirement has changed. Then test B and C fail. Why have test B and C failed? Oh, because I changed this thing in test A. How long is it going to take you to find that out? Ages. It's a nightmare. And it also means you can't run your tests in parallel, so don't do that. And we'll talk about test data in just a minute, assuming you don't run out of time. Asynchrony, we've talked about asynchrony. That's a leading cause of problems. Um, resource leaks, I mean, those are out of memory errors. Those are real bugs. You should fix them. And that's one of the things that acceptance tests do that unit tests can't do, which is why it's important to write unit uh, acceptance tests. Um, and time. Whenever you have time in your application, you need to mock it out and create a, a layer over, you know, in, in your actual production code. And this is one of the few times when we recommend putting a backdoor in. You should be able to swap out all the things that talk about time in your application for mock versions of them at runtime when you're running your tests so that you can test for what happens when there's a leap second without actually waiting for a leap second, for example. <laughs> and then the final one is interactions between the system on the test and external systems, which you're going to talk about. Sure. So external systems tend to be another of those things which lead to a lot of flaky tests. Um, so uh, a lot of, most of us, well, how many of us actually build systems that have to integrate with external third-party systems, not on Rocket? <laughs> yeah, I kind of thought so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't all have the benefit of just building the next uh, Rails application that shows pretty colors in Ajax and allows you to build a to-do list. Um, not that there's no value in those, but we all write systems that depend on external systems, and they are notoriously difficult, because typically, it's probably sitting on an AS400 machine somewhere in a place where you don't control it, and you can't stub it or mock it. Uh, so the way you go about making these tests reliable is, first off, don't have all your tests call the external system. Uh, have your application structured in such a way that you can actually parameterize the connections to the external system. Have it be a config parameter, don't hard code it in your code. Uh, run integration smoke tests, the tests that would actually, the few tests that would actually go to the external system. Make sure you run them before your acceptance test suite. Um, and then use what we call the impersonator pattern. Um, so create a proxy from the system under test to the external system. Um, cache the results from the integration smoke test. So when the test actually went all the way to the external system and came back with data, cache the results, cache the request and response in a simple hash. Um, run the integration smoke test before the acceptance test suite, uh, then use that data and uh, periodically expire the cache. Have the rest of your acceptance test basically use this cached value. And that's why it's called the impersonator. Uh, the object that you create impersonates the external system while still returning relevant data that was re actually returned by the system not more than a couple of minutes ago. And only run your acceptance suite if the integration smoke test passes. In other words, it's not enough to run one of these. You've got to run both, but minimize the surface area of contact between your acceptance test suite or your regression suite and the external system. Whenever you have a componentized system, you always want to be able to run acceptance tests against the individual components. And in order to do that, you need to be able to create, um, you need to be able to impersonate the the interactions with the external systems. Uh, and those, those impersonators, the, the term of those, the term of art for those is test doubles. There's a book called X-Unit Test Patterns by Gerald Messeros, and he talks about test doubles. Test doubles can be stubs or mocks, uh, and impersonator is another example of a test double. Mm -hmm. um, so this is our last principle. Acceptance tests are responsible for managing their own test data. So the short version of this is don't use production data dumps to run your acceptance tests against. Or backdoor controllers. <laughs> or backdoor controllers or other stuff like that. The, the test data should be explicitly set up by the acceptance tests. Um, and so, I mean, I, I just want to briefly go through the three kinds of test data. Um, there's three kinds. Application reference data is the data that your application needs to start up. So that might be like lists of country codes and other stuff like that. Test reference data is data that is necessary for the test to run, but you don't assert against that data at the end of the test. And then finally, there's test-specific data, which is the data that's set up in the course of the test, which you actually run assertions against, which determines whether the test actually passes or fails. So these are the three kinds of uh, test data. Uh, application reference data you can set up as part of the deployment process, but test reference data and test-specific data should both be set up by the actual acceptance test. And you can actually do that as part of your journey. Part of your journey should be setting up, you know, at the beginning of the journey, the necessary stuff for the journey to actually execute. So setting up, creating users, and creating um, you know, uh, accounts and other stuff that you need for your test to, to run. It's, 
This is the most important thing. You need to ensure that tests can be run independently from each other simultaneously, both so you can parallelize and so you don't have flakiness from dependencies between tests. And there's various mechanisms for doing this. And it's actually something around, there's something around application architecture here. But what you could do, for example, is when your test harness creates a user, append a UUID to the username so that it ensures that every time a user is created by your test harness, it will be unique. And the same with every other object that your test harness creates. Have the test harness make sure that every object that is created by a test will be unique. And that way you ensure that the test can't stomp on each other. Uh, and that, that's a, a really simple but, but powerful way to make sure that the tests will run independently of each other. Um, uh, that, that, that'll do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> you just need, uh, the, the point is to think about this up front and to make sure that your system on a test and your test harness are written in such a way that you can run the test simultaneously. It's a very common mistake not to do this, and you, it just hoses you totally. It's really evil. Um, there are places for production data dumps. Someone yesterday was showing me some insane tool that lets you product, uh, snapshot terabytes of data in a few seconds, and he kind of pointed to where I say this, and kind of was like, ha, ah, what about this awesome tool? So, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, but what we recommend is, you know, you want to use production data for performance testing. That's really important. Um, and maybe for staging as well but they have, production data has no place in acceptance tests. And part of the reason for that is doing triage when acceptance tests fail is really hard when you have production data dumps. Um, because you're not, I mean, whenever you want to reproduce a, a, a bug, you work out the smallest possible way to reproduce it, right? The limiting case. That's what your acceptance tests are. They're the limiting case on how to reproduce a bug. So when you have a problem in production, you're trying to reproduce that. What's the limiting case? Well, guess what? That, that's what your acceptance test is. You, I mean, whenever you reproduce a bug, you don't use the production data set. It's just, you know, and the same should be true of your acceptance test. So last things you want to say, because we're out of time. Um, these were the principles. Treat acceptance tests like production code. Always interact with the system on a test like a user would. Continuously create your user journeys. Collective ownership of acceptance tests and acceptance tests own their data. Those are the five principles that we went through. And then, you know, this is what we said at the beginning. These are, are the takeaways. Please fill in your feedback forms uh, and let us know how we did. This is the first time we've done this. We want to do it again. Please let us know what we could do better next time uh, so that we can do better next time. Thank you very much. Thank you.